Jesus God? And if he is God, where in the Bible does it state that he's God? All right, let's see it. John chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus says, Before Abraham was born, I am. Now, the Jews did not call God G-O-D. The Jews called God Yahweh, which is the Hebrew verb to be. I am who I am. There was no misunderstanding. The Jews picked up stones to stone him for blasphemy. Before Abraham was born, I am. Deliberately, Christ is claiming to be God. So this is an attempt to try to assert that there is only one answer to the New Testament's algebra regarding Jesus' relationship to God. But there is a better answer that was already in circulation within the Judaism of the time. There is a more explicit and direct and intentional way to claim to be God. And we see the messenger of Adonai in Exodus 3, 6, using that method when saying to Moses, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. So it can be that explicit for an entity that is not God. What we have in John 8:58 58 is not that explicit. It is just Jesus saying before Abraham was ego e me, which is a standard clause in Greek, but also happens to overlap with the way the Septuagint has rendered two different means of self-identification by God. Now, this is claiming some kind of special relationship to God's name, but it is not necessarily saying, I am God, because in this time period, there was a tradition in circulation that would continue in circulation for centuries after this time period as well, regarding authorized possession of the divine name and the exercise of divine prerogatives and the manifestation of divine presence. We see this solution already way back in Exodus 23 verses 20 and 21, where God says they're going to send an angel before the Israelites, and that angel will have authority over the forgiveness of sins. Why? Because my name is in him. And this is a way to suggest that the name is a communicable vehicle of divine agency, divine authority, and divine presence. And this is further developed within Greco-Roman period Judaism. You have the Enochic son of man, who is named with the name, the divine name, before the foundation of the earth. And this is one of the things that will facilitate everyone on earth worshiping the Son of Man. We have the Apocalypse of Abraham and the angel Yahuwah explaining to Abraham that they uh, engage in creative acts and do the things that only God is supposed to do by virtue of the mediation of the divine name. We even have Metatron asserting possession of the divine name. And in later Jewish texts, people confusing Metatron for Adonai because Metatron possesses Adonai's name and can be referred to as Adonai as a result. Uh, they're even referred to as the Adonai Katon, the little Adonai in another text. And so what is going on in John 8:58 is participating in this tradition regarding the divine name. Jesus is not saying, I am God. Jesus is using this Greek translation of Echia Asher Echia as well as Anihu to kind of wink and say, I am the authorized possessor of the divine name, as it says in the hymn in Philippians, that he was given the name that is above all other names. So this is the significance of the repeated use of this phrase, ego e me. It is not to identify Jesus as God, but to identify Jesus as the authorized possessor of the divine name, and therefore authorized to exercise divine prerogatives, authorized to manifest the divine presence. And this is how seeing Jesus is seeing God. It's the exact same logic of divine images. And I discuss this in much more detail in my book, Adonai's Divine Images, A Cognitive Approach. You can find free access to the PDF of this book through my link tree. Then in John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. No misunderstanding. They didn't think, oh, I see this guy's a Hindu. He thinks everybody's part of God, so he's claiming that he were all a part of God. No, no, no. Jesus was a monotheistic Jew. Jesus was not monotheistic because monotheism did not exist within centuries of Jesus' lifetime. And I and a few friends have organized a conference that will take place next May at Brown University on why the Bible is not monotheistic. And I'll have more details on that in the future. And very deliberately, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Once again, no misunderstanding, the Jews pick up stones to stone him for blasphemy. So two concerns here. First, the fact that John is representing these Jewish people is 
being pretty trigger happy uh, with their accusations of blasphemy is not an indication that they understood he was claiming to be God. It is a part of the author's anti-Semitism, but additionally, claiming to be the authorized possessor of the divine name and claiming to be one with God are also things that could be interpreted as blasphemous in this time period. So there is not only one solution to the algebra of why Jesus is saying these things. There are other solutions, and in fact, there is a readily available solution that is developed in the Hebrew Bible and further elaborated on within Greco-Roman period Judaism that makes much better sense of what is going on in the New Testament as well as in the Gospel of John specifically. The other concern is that Jesus saying, I and the Father are one, is not a claim to being God, particularly in light of the intercessory prayer in John 17, where the author represents Jesus praying three times that his followers become one with him just as he is one with the Father, so that they are all one together. So if we want to understand Jesus claiming to be God by saying, I and the Father are one, then we must understand Jesus praying that all of his followers become God, just as he is God. That does not make sense of this text. There are absolutely no grounds for arguing that in the intercessory prayer, Jesus is referring to some other kind of oneness, given that he explicitly states that the kind of oneness he wants his followers to achieve is the exact same kind of oneness that he has with God. Then by his deeds, he obviously claimed to be God. Mark chapter 2, Jesus is teaching in a packed out house and all of a sudden the roof is ripped open and a man, a paralyzed man, is lowered on a mat to his feet. Jesus looks into the face of the paralyzed man and says, your sins are forgiven. George, you got it. And then they got mad and they were confused. He was shown a way that forgiving sins is way more powerful than raising a man who's crippled. Bingo. By claiming to forgive the sins of a man he'd never probably seen before, Jesus is claiming to be God because only God can ultimately forgive my sins. This is a flagrant misreading of this story, which is representing the Jewish folks as misunderstanding their own tradition. As I already explained, God gives the angel in Exodus 23 verses 20 to 21 authority over the forgiveness of sins. So it is not true that only God can forgive sins. In fact, Jesus later on is going to give his disciples authority over the forgiveness of sins as well. So Mark 2 is not representing Jesus as operating within this expectation of the Jewish crowd. It is representing the Jewish crowd as misunderstanding, which is why Jesus' response is not wink, wink. Jesus' response is so that you might know Correcting your misunderstanding that the Son of Man has authority on earth as well to forgive sins. Jesus is not saying, yes, you're right. What do you think that means about me? Jesus is saying, no, you're wrong. You don't understand the existing tradition regarding the Son of Man, who also has authority to forgive sins. Again, going back to the idea in Exodus 23, verses 20 to 21, that the angel has authority over the forgiveness of sins. Why? Because my name is in him. The angel is the authorized possessor of the divine name. Jesus is saying the very same. I am the authorized possessor of the divine name.